thank you very much, Raul. If you don't mind, we're going to go on uh, on the agenda. I'll talk to you later. And uh, Sorin, whenever you're ready, I would like to introduce the next topic, which uh, will be on uh, standards in public procurement, a very interesting subject. And I thank hope you. you really enjoy this talk, which I find myself very interesting on the way we can use uh, standards for public procurement. Soren Jensen is an environmental engineer and owner of the Danish consultant company Densense. Uh, amongst others, he, con he conducts training of national central authorities as well as local contracting authorities in Europe on referencing of standards in technical specifications according to the European Public Procurement Directive. Uh, he will be talking about specifically about the Article 42 and others uh, about the standards. As a consultant, he's also, he also wrote the European Guide on Referencing of Standards in Public Procurement, funded by the European Commission and including several national standardization bodies in the development. Um, so, sorry, uh, if you can hear me and you are ready to go, uh, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, George, and uh, I am ready. So, uh, here you are. Perfect. <laughs> can you see my presentation? Yes. For first, uh, you already made the presentation, uh, Jorge, so uh, I will I would uh, draw, draw, drop that. But for first, I would let me say that it was very, very interesting to listen to Mr. Uh, Raul Sabima's uh, presentation. Also because he touches something very problematic, cross-border trade. And it's not just making it easy to just uh, have agreements cross-border, Actually, some of the work to you use there, you need to use there is uh, standards. And I will make a very short and very uh, concentrated introduction to what is actually standards, but in two seconds. I jump uh, this one because you already pre presented me, so thank you. I'm running a network uh, and having a training for 24 countries in Europe on Article 42 in the Public Procurement Directive, the Classical Directive. And there's a good reason for that. And the number of participants uh, increases for each meeting. In this uh, network, there are 24 pub uh, 20 public procurement authorities, and these are the central public procurement authorities. And also 19 uh, uh, national standardization bodies. This is where they come from. I'll not spend time on that. You can just see it there later. But as mentioned, the first reason for this was actually this European guide we wrote uh, together with a lot of countries. And also one more thing was an, was an initial analysis of how is it actually going in Europe and how to reference standards. Do the public contracting authority reference standards at all? Uh, that was pretty interesting, and I will come back to this later. For first, we need to settle what is a standard, because we all have our standards, and we all have our own agreement, uh, what is a standard, and talk about all kinds of standard contracts. But in this context, in the Article 42, uh, in the classical directive, a standard means a technical specification adopted by a recognized standardization body for repeated or continuous application with which compliance is not compulsory and which is one of the following. So using standards is voluntary, but they are either international standards, European standards, national standards, or European technical assessments or common technical assessments. Uh, and that was that, uh, that's actually when you look about the international standards, you have these ones, ISO, of course, you always all maybe know about quality management, ISO 9001, or uh, environmental management, ISO 14001. But they can also be European standards for CEN, CENELEC, or ETSI. Or of course, the national standards, these are, for example, uh, Spain or um, Poland or Denmark. They have one thing in common, and this is what actually makes them the standard. They have the same ident uh, identification, with nomenclature for standards. And it looks like this. You have certain standards, AXX stands could be 
Una for Spain, it could be PKN for Poland or whatever, but it's a very specific uh, nomenclature here. The European International Standard, ISO 14001, 2015. And the text in this case, oh, sorry, I was a little bit fast there. It is the same wherever you have developed these uh, recognized standards. This one is for the environmental management systems, for example. And it looks easy here, but actually we have the first challenge here already, because who knows what this means? Contracting authority? Very often, no. Actually, there are more standards also recognized. The standards called European Technical Assessment, ETAs, they are developed by something called EOTA, EOTA uh, in Europe. And uh, I think that's 26 or 27 countries at this mark. But this is mentioned, I will show you in a little while. Or there could be common technical specifications are developed outside these standardization organizations, but they also have recommendations. If you do not uh, fulfill some of these recommendations, they cannot be referenced. So Article 42, it may be a small article, but it's extremely relevant. And mentioning standardization organizations today, they are part of their feasibility uh, organizations. They make sure the standards are developed. They do not necessarily know what's in the standard, but they make sure the right people come together and develop these standards. This also means that standardization organizations uh, very often do not know actually how to use standards in public procurement. They just develop them. I've been participating in uh, several uh, standardization committees, technical committees over the last years, and constantly trying to make them more open because it needs to be used for co contracting authorities. It's difficult. And everybody who reads a standard, the European standard, for example, no, it is very difficult. But Article 42 in the directive says explicitly that without prejudice pre to mandatory national technical rules to the extent that they are compatible with un union law, the technical specifications shall be formulated in one of the following ways. I say shall because it's extremely important here. There are only four ways of doing it. In terms of performance or functional requirements, which is good, it is used by 99.5% at least of contracting authorities in Europe. So this is how you describe what you need yourself. And uh, comparing this to what uh, Mr. Raul Savima said about cross-border trade, this makes it difficult because for example, drones, every organization describes their own needs for drones, their own specification for drones instead of using standards, which must, would be make it easier. That's just an example. But this is the good old way and it still function uh, very much. Then there are three other ways because, but they all say by reference to technical specifications and in order of preference to national standards, transposing European standards, European technical assessments, and so on. I will also show you this later. Or if you take 42.3.C, with reference to technical specifications, referred to in point B, and the 42.3.D is the same. So all of these requires knowledge to the use of standards. And I have now been conducting training in seven countries in Europe, specific workshops um, or seminars. And unfortunately, most people, which is for now approximately 500 persons uh, being gone through the training, they have no idea on how to use this part of Article 42. That sets limitations. And if you don't know what a standard is and you don't know how to use a standard, you already have uh, huge issues within safety, for example, and innovation, because innovation uh, starts with basic requirements, minimum requirements, for example, standards. They can set the same minimum requirements and then you can be innovative. They can also make sure when you trade cross-border, then you can actually uh, 
have the minimum requirements together, and then you can just add a little bit extra if you like. But then you are in the same area and builders know what to do. So this is challenge two. And I have made these as challenges and you should actually one day, if you have time, try to test some of the challenges I mentioned here. You will be surprised. This analysis uh, that I mentioned, uh, promised to mention, also focused if the contracting authorities are actually aware of what is going on with standards. And we asked if 3,500 persons and the response uh, was 14% or 420 persons, 23 persons, sorry. It was within the sex as construction, medical device and waste. Here you have the countries, Spain, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Norway and Sweden. Interestingly enough, was that the sur survey persons who are replied this was extremely competent. Many, many years, more than eight years of experience and more than 50 public tenders. And the main reasons for standard referencing standards were, they are good for describing minimum requirements, as I mentioned before, setting the low bar, the, the common bar. They provide clear specifications, which is intended by standards. And they are an integrated part of the market. And the private sector said, mm, fine, they, we, uh, we use the standards because uh, they ask for the standards. Problem is that 95% or more of all standards uh, developed, not just in Europe and internationally, they are developed by private sector and not public sector. It is increasing uh, slowly, but surely uh, public sector goes into this and developing new standards. So that's good, but we also have some bad things because they actually do not know how to reference standards in public procurement. And this is also less than 2% of 500 people to now trained where we have experienced exactly the same. Without uh, hurting anyone, I would say the largest uh, trade company or uh, contracting authority in Denmark, uh, I had them training last summer and they had no idea about this and they've been doing that for 20 years. So it is a problem. So what is their problems? What are the problems? They say standards, they are um, considered to increase quality and transparency. But what are about productivity, competition, cross-border trade? Here you see 37%, yes, 36% uh, 30, mean that they increase cross-border. 38% mean eh, maybe, don't know, and 25% no, definitely not. So we have a challenge in cross-border trade for sure. So another problem is here that when you do know if the, any of these uh, standards have been referenced as part of procurement, uh, procurement documents, international standards, everybody is, yes, 84%, we reference international standard. And national standards, 67%. Only problem here is that only a very few national standards have been de developed the last 20 years. So they actually think they are national. This is they're not necessarily national. They could, might as well be European or international. So contracting authorities are not aware of what type of standards they reference. And one big problem in Europe here is this one, harmonized European standards. It is that 20% of all European standards they're developed as harmonized standards. And what does that mean? That means that it's a way of opening the market. And harmonized standards is compliant with the new, with European legislation, with European law. So it's easy if you reference these kind of harmonized standards to comply with European law, but nobody knows about it. Yes, of course, if you're at university and study it, but if you are contracting authority, they have no knowledge about how to reference standards. So this is a, a new challenge. Again, I give the challenges, try and ask one day. And this is also a big challenge because where did these 20, 420 people learn about referencing of standards? 55%, they used them in similar public tenders, meaning they are self-taught but they have looked in old procurement documents and 
just like a contract uh, under the, the directive is changed, is renewed every four or five years, then the same happens with standards. So if they look in old material, the standards are most likely not relevant. So we need training, European training in this area. And that's also within innovation and safety, extremely important. But we're not done yet. Where are the standards primarily mentioned? Now we're talking procedures, open procedures. Yes, everybody uses them there. But if you look at the rest, for example, innovation partnership, only 10% says, yes, we use them there. But these standards can be used in any uh, procedure, procurement procedure. There shouldn't be any difference at all. Again, back to the challenge that they are not completely aware of the use of standards. So enough about that. This is Article 423B, uh, and this is order of preference. This is what it means. If you are to reference European or international standards or national standards, the first and most important is if there is a European standard A, then this is to be referenced first. And there uh, can be no uh, other standards there. This makes it easy. easy. For example, you can use ISO 14001. This is a European standard. Even though it has been developed by ISO, it is implemented in Europe as a European standard. This means that you have to know the nomenclature, as I mentioned earlier, to identify them. We can just jump down here and say, for example, national standards. If you develop your own safety standards nationally, you do not have to compare, you cannot use them in any other countries. You are allowed to reference them, but if you put up a public tender, you need to address your own national standards as your requirements. And if there are any of the other standards above from A to E, you cannot use your national standard. So it's extremely important to know what you're doing here when you reference standards. And uh, at the bottom, you can see uh, that you should always add or equivalent, because if you have a national standard, another country might have an almost similar national standard, which is or equivalent. This is training we do uh, a lot of actually. Uh, most important is that this list is exhaustive, meaning that if you have other kind of standards, you cannot use them here. Then you need uh, another kind of documentation, which actually is a problem because contracting authorities does not even know, most of them actually does not even know how this works. But complications are increasing because who takes responsibility, ownership, sorry, to Article 42.3. We have the procurement process here from planning, notification, draft contract, sign contract, ordering, contract management, evaluation. The first part, light blue, is normally always uh, developed by the legal advisors. They know the procedures, no process, know exactly how to uh, put it up, but they do not always know what do they actually need? What is the product? What is the service? This is another chair. This is the daily purchases. We need this kind of drones. We need to do this. We need to do that. And they have very specific knowledge on what they require. It is very important that these two uh, players are put together to develop a, a good uh, tender, even if it's cross-border or even if it's innovative, because also data purchasers know the kind of innovation they need. Legal advisors know processes. Here, things very often go wrong because Sometimes these people do not actually talk together or do not meet up and discuss it probably in the beginning and make sure that we exactly what's needed. We've seen thousands of examples on this uh, procurement gone wrong simply because of this. Challenge number seven. We have another challenge here because if you do not know about standards, then things get even worse in the directive. We have Article 42, technical specifications, which we've talked about. Article 43 is about labels. They are based on international standards. It would make it so much easier if we had 
to have reference labels to use them when you know about standards and standardization. But here, and which is very important in, the, in safety and innovation, is how do we actually reference test re reports or certification and all the means of proof? How do we make sure we have the correct documentation? This is actually the best part of international standardization. It has been documented and there are standards to make sure that you can get exactly what you need here. You can provide the correct documentation and this could save many, many, maybe five or 10% of the total European budget of public procurement. And that's big. And the same uh, when it comes to means of proof, how do we actually make sure we have this means of proof? It's again reference to European and international standards. And there are actually many more articles, but this is very practical. The contracting authorities need to know about referencing of standards according to the directive or else the risk, uh, uh, lack of uh, transparency that needs to increase uh, the risk, increased costs and especially also cross-border trade, which is not as high as it should be. I fully agree. So if knowledge of referency of standards is missing, documenting proper public procurement gets very difficult. You hear a lot about people sitting weeks comparing tender uh, uh, bits, but that's not necessary. You can use maybe one or two hours if you have the correct uh, requirements on test reports, certification, or the means of proof, then you don't, have to, you don't have to do that. They have to do it. The provider or the bidder will have to uh, make sure they have the proof needed. So there's a lot of work here. And just to put up an example here, the annual budget in Europe is approximately 2,000 billion euro or 14% of the GDP per year. And there are 250,000 public entities in Europe. If we can save just 1% of this, we save 20 billion a year over at least five years because it takes five years to implement the knowledge of standards and in public procurement and of old contracts running out and new being started. But my, my estimate is that we can save maybe between 10, five and 10%. In the situation Europe is in right now, I think this is actually, it's simple, it's basic training, it needs to be done. And if I'm right, and we can save five or 10%, that's a lot of money to, you know, that can be used for other things, green economy, uh, or help uh, in this situation in national. So if we get there, I think we are far, but we need to, basically learn about how to use standards. And I must say also in safety area, there is hundreds, if not thousands of standards that needs to be developed to initiate or to start very more cross-border training. This is similarly necessary. Of course, defense rules are different and they, uh, sometimes it can be different there, but uh, difficult there, but some basic uh, instruments are needed to increase collaboration and uh, purchase. So the only guide so far developed is the one I developed. I wrote it after publishing the, or the European Commission published the guide. This guide for sustainable building renovation is showing public procurement uh, contracting authorities how to actually conduct public procurement in uh, renovation of buildings or even also new buildings. So my idea could be, should the second sector be a sector specific guide for contracting authorities on say, security procurement, so security innovation procurement, could be an idea just as a first example. That's all that I wanted to say, and I hope you understood. I know it's, this is difficult, but knowing that there's an article in the public procurement di directive with, where three fourths uh, of this article is not known to contracting authorities, we do have a problem. So thank you, and I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much, Thorin. <clears throat> So 
So yeah, definitely this is a really interesting topic on standards and uh, I was myself a little bit, um, you know, um, I had some apprehension at the beginning when we start talking about the standards and how we can uh, work on standards in, in the security sector, but I think we have all the opportunities to explore on this. We have some meetings spending uh, with you, Soren, about this in France. We have been working on standards as well. Um, I would like to address some of the questions that I have uh, via Slido. Um, what will be the most relevant use of standards in public procurement is the first question that I have. The most important thing in public procurement is setting minimum requirements, minimum requirements that everybody can agree, agree on, also cross-border. That's important because there might be, for, you can look uh, just in the defense area in Europe. We have, uh, for example, in the battle tanks, there's so many different kinds and now it's almost impossible to do anything together. If we had some basic, just basic uh, standards on some of the parts so that you guys said they could be used uh, jointly would be easier. So settling my minimum requirements that all agree on this first step. Thank you, thank you very much. And another is very linked to the previous question. How can we steer or influence standards in working groups to facilitate the tasks of public procurement? How can we influence standards? Yes, but that's actually pretty easy because uh, in this security area, there are already technical committees and uh, national standardization committees too. So it's simply contacting the standardization organization in your country and telling them, we wish to know more about this. And if there's no standards as you require, they can start a new technical committee. It only requires five countries to agree we need a standard in this area. Then you can establish a technical committee and start developing standards. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to highlight something that you just mentioned during your presentation is the, the fact that we need to know standards if we want to apply them, of course. And I think it's a very nice way to secure our contractual documents. And why not just, we were just talking about uh, right before of the PCP presentations, that those kind of procedures can be time consuming. So if we want to standardize and just um, facilitate the work for procurers, when we reference to a standard, if we manage to, uh, to know what it is about, I think we can reduce the time for the, for the procedures in general. Okay, um, Sorin, thank you very much for your presentation. I hope we can meet very soon and um, I will follow up with the agenda of the day. Thank you very much, Sorin. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.